Hi, I'm Elise Glennon with New Jersey Sharing Network. The Transplant Games of America are coming to New Jersey in the summer of 2020, and we encourage you to learn more about organ and tissue donation. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center. This place is different. The New Jersey Education Association. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. New Jersey Resources. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. And by Wells Fargo. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. And AM 970, The Answer. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. It's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Jim Dryley, Executive Director of the School of Criminal Justice and Public Administration at Kane University. Good to see you, Jim. My pleasure to be here. Um, I was just telling you before we got in the air, I read an article that you were quoted in. I believe it was in the ledger. Check it out on NJ.com as well and other places where the question about gun violence this was after some horrific incidents, whether in Dayton or in El Paso, and unfortunately they happen all too often. And you were quoted extensively talking about some of the things we need to do to end gun violence. Let me get into this. Right out of the box, the connection between gun violence and white supremacy is? I don't see a connection, a causal connection, in the sense that we want to put our finger on one particular reason. Um, with the gun violence that we see in the United States, uh, it's, it's multivariate. Um, there are individuals that believe in a certain ideology that will use violence to advance their ideologies. But there's other individuals, because of mental health or emotional issues, they use gun violence for whatever purpose that they choose. And then other individuals in a reactive way uh, based on circumstances within their lives. So I don't see it as one specific... But, there, but folks involved in the white supremacy movement are, in fact, based on the folks we've talked to in Homeland Security and other places, in terms of domestic threat, domestic terrorism, they're at the top of that list. They are now, because in, in, in the way that it's, it's occurring and the individuals are advancing that ideology. But we can't ignore that there are other Outside uh, circumstances. Yes. You've said, uh, let's go through some options, because I hate when people say, what's the fix? There's no one fix to gun violence, correct? Correct. Let's do this. Banning assault weapons, no brainer? It, it's a no-brainer in the sense that you ban them. So where do you ban them? At manufacture? Do you ban them at possession? Is it a collective ban? Uh, how do you go? There's, there's commentary now where they're going to look for buybacks on assault weapons. Uh, we're talking a, a major, major undertaking uh, on a national scale here. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, and is it going to happen completely? Absolutely. Not 100 percent. Dr. Lamanskis, so there are New Jersey laws and there are national laws. New Jersey's gun laws among, many say, the toughest in the nation, you say? I agree. Based on what? What are some of the keys to them? Well, in, in New Jersey, uh, it's been longstanding practice that if you're going to apply for a uh, permit to purchase a, a rifle or ammunition, you go through a, a, uh, an application process. At the local level... Is that level, a background check? Uh, it is. It, at the local level, it's conducted by the uh, police. Um, if you don't have a local police, it's conducted by the uh, New Jersey State Police if you're in a rural district. Um, it includes uh, personal demographic information. Uh, you, you submit fingerprints. You'll go through the process there. Um, they generate a single number that stays with you for life, uh, an SBI number, State Bureau of Identification. And no matter what you do in the firearms application purchasing process in the state of New Jersey, it's, it's very closely uh, watched and regulated. Okay, so in the, in the national government, federal government, president right after some of these horrific incidents said, you know what? Background checks. Two days later, eh, not so sure. Then after that, background checks. 
Should the federal government, not just each state, look at background checks, but should the federal government simply, by law, require a background check to get a gun? That's a constitutional question that to be best answered by... But isn't it a practical question beyond the law? I'm asking if, in fact, our goal is to reduce gun violence, wouldn't a federal law that mandates a background check before you could purchase a firearm make sense as opposed to some states have it, some states don't? It, it, it's a constitutional question. It's also a practical right. question as to implementation of a law. From the practicality standpoint, I agree with you 100%. Uh, if it can be done nationally, I, I support that. Could I have no problem done? with this. I, I don't know. I, I mean, you're talking now about... Uh, you think that's politics? You I think, do. Because you separate yourself. I'm sorry for interrupting. You told me right before we got on the air, I've been in law enforcement. You're a police... Uh, you're a law enforcement in West Orange, a top leader there in West Orange Police Department. 25 years? Yes, 25. And you moved into academia. So is there for policy and politics outside of your purview? Well... The, you can't ignore the politics. Go ahead. And so the policy is going to be set by those that are in office, elected office. Uh, they appoint individuals, uh, directors, commissioner, forms of government, whatever you may have, um, and they follow and adhere uh, to the policy that is set. But in, in a lot of this right now, uh, we, we, can't, we can't seem to get through the political noise. rhetoric, the dialogue, the noise. That's an excellent well, way to describe it. But what a background check... Federal background check, because I'm going to ask you about red laws in just a second. Would a federal background check be helpful? Yes. Red laws, what are they? Why don't we have them? Well, so red laws, uh, basically red flag, that's what we're uh, referring to. So if, if there's something in a person's uh, life, in their background, in their past, uh, that would raise a red flag and uh, a cause for concern. And we've seen this when we look back at, at some of the shootings, uh, the mass shootings that have occurred in, in the past 20, 25 years. Um, there were red flags. Uh, individuals were exhibiting um, and manifesting certain forms of behavior. Uh, they were acting out, uh, oftentimes in, in a violent way, um, but the dots were not being connected. And in those cases, if the dots had been connected, if individuals had talked uh, with each other, amongst each other, um, including uh, involving law enforcement to some extent, um, then we may have been able to mitigate, we may have been able to prevent. Take um, those guns? I mean, because what ultimately, what's the action on the part of the government? Isn't it to take the guns from those people? Well, I think initially it would be to prevent access. So if it's going to be taking and okay. it's temporarily holding, um, you know, so the, the weapon may not belong to the individual, but it may be within the household. But the red, you're saying that this red flag law, if you will, tries to identify folks who should not have guns. Or access to guns, both. Okay. I'm curious about this. Um, got background in mental health. This whole question about, is it a mental health issue? Is it that there are too many guns? Is it the NRA? It's no one thing. Correct. We look for, everybody wants a single cure, a panacea. What's the answer? Um, it, communication. Is that, is, no, but I'm saying when, rhetorically, when someone says, what's the answer? Is there really an answer, one? No. We need to communicate, and we don't. Uh, whether it be between um, education, a local uh, elementary school, uh, individuals even in higher education. We've seen instances where, where these uh, have occurred in colleges and universities. Workplace violence. Um, there are things that go on in people's lives that people do make the connection, but that information isn't brought out to someone that could maybe intervene. And not in a uh, taking away somebody's you know, full liberties, taking somebody into custody, but to be aware uh, to look into things a little bit deeper, a little bit further, and that's not happening. Um, when, when you look at a person who, who has a problem with alcohol, and everybody knows that this person has a problem with alcohol, but nobody talks, and it's not until something happens, that person's involved in an accident, or they do something, oh, well, you know, we knew that that person had a problem with alcohol. That may seem like a very simple analogy, but it's not. The same thing occurs with this type of violence. People are aware, but there's not a communication, there's not a connection. Dr. Jim Dryley from Kane University, I want to thank you for joining us. You understand these issues, not just from an academic perspective, but frankly, you were out there as a law enforcement professional for many years, and we thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jim. Stay right. right there. Okay. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato, and we'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org.
Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs is pleased to welcome uh, Carol Johnson, the Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Human Services. Good to see you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Make it clear what you're responsible for. It's a huge department. Yes, I'm really honored to be the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services under Governor Murphy. We run the state's Medicaid program that provides health care coverage to 1.7 million New Jerseyans. We provide food assistance to 700,000 New Jerseyans through our SNAP program. We're the child care agency. We're the aging agency. We're the agency for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We're the mental health and substance use disorder agency. Um, so we have a wide range it's of services. a huge services. portfolio. Um, Commissioner, do this because you mentioned child care. The the, you were with us early on in the Murphy administration, and we talked about an initiative you're about to see on camera right now, our initiative called Right from the Start NJ focusing on improving the child care situation and other related issues for infants and toddlers. We talked about it at the beginning. You are with us now. Since then, just recently, there's a $54 million in additional funding that's going toward what as it relates to child care, and how does that relate to this initiative? Well, thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done on Ready for the Start. And with for a lot of and, 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 and all the partners across the state. Those, those, that work and our partners across the state and advocates across the state have, have been part of our shared goal of saying that what we need to do is to invest in quality, affordable child care. And it's very rare that you have a policy issue that's really a twofer. And in this instance, investing in good child, quality child care is a twofer because the science tells us all about brain development. We need to have quality child care and services for children. But the economics tell us good quality child care are what, gonna, are what is what's going to help families feel safe and comfortable and be in the workforce. And so too many women are not in the workforce because they mm. don't have confidence in quality and So this $54 million dollars goes to? $54 million dollars goes to families to help them afford quality, affordable mm. child care. So what we've done is raise the rates basically that we pay for child care. We provide a subsidy to families who are lower and moderate income to help them afford child care. As you know, child care is a very expensive uh, uh, endeavor. Um, and, and we want families to be able to shop for and get the best, highest quality child care. So we not only have invested in raising the rates, but we also are investing in quality, a quality rating system where we'll pay more if you choose a higher quality mm. child care center. Um, and what we've done is because so many advocates across the state have helped us appreciate the challenge Including we have. advocates for children in New Jersey and our friends Cecilia Zalkin. That's ahead. right. That's right. Um, that we have, we have a challenge in it, particularly in getting infant care um, and so we leaned heavily and fa and put that money more heavily into infant care rates so between January of 2018 when we came in in the Murphy administration and January of this upcoming year we will have increased the child care subsidy rate for infants by about 40 percent mm. in this state um, to try to make it more affordable and accessible for families to get that high quality care by the way if you want to find out more information on right from the start check out our website switch gears can we talk about the um, opioid crisis in the state? Again, people say, oh, that's, I guess that's the Department of Health. There's no one state agency that's dealing with the opioid crisis. The Department of Human Services directly involved doing what, and what does that have to do with Narcan? So, so two things. We are the state's Medicaid agency, which means we provide health care coverage for 1.7 million folks in our state. About 500,000 of those individuals gain coverage because of the Affordable Care Act's Medicaid expansion. Those, it won't surprise you to know, are the people who have been left behind in health care coverage for a really long time. Single adults with incomes under 138 percent of poverty, so many of those individuals had substance use disorder challenges. So what we're doing is getting coverage to people. And then what we said in our agency um, when we came in in the Murphy administration was, what are the barriers to people getting opioid use disorder treatment. And one of the big barriers that we had was our own Medicaid program was, cause, was forcing people to jump through hoops and get prior authorization before they could get medication-assisted treatment. So we got rid of that prior authorization. We're paying providers better to offer that treatment. We are creating support networks so that healthcare providers have resources and know who they can turn to when they have complex cases. So we're really trying to build up a environment that supports medication-assisted treatment, which is what the evidence says works in treating opioid use disorder. But you also mentioned naloxone. Yeah, there's a free naloxone day. 
When is that? And by the way, we're, we're taping. That happens to be in June. It happened in but, June of this year. Okay, we're, ta we're taping in the fall of 2019. Go ahead. So in June of this year, Will we, there be another one? We're, our, we're, our goal is to have as many as possible, okay. with depending what, what on our resources. What happens on that day? Sorry for interrupting. So here, here's by the way, so you're listening, if you're listening on the audio side, Dr. Excuse me, Carol Johnson is, in fact, the commissioner of the Department of Human Services in the state. Go ahead. So we said... Everyone in the clinical world knows that naloxone should be in the hands of as many residents in our state as possible. The Surgeon General has said that. Every clinician knows that that when a, an overdose is going to happen, when an overdose happens in your community, this is, it used to be a more complicated device. Now it is a simple nasal spray that can be used to reverse an opioid overdose. So everyone should have one. I carry one in my purse. Everyone should, should be able to access this. So we said, why don't we have a free day where it's available at all pharmacies that can participate and that individuals don't need to give their name, they don't need to have an individual prescription, and they can come get it for free. We partnered with 174 mm. pharmacies across the state and 16,000 New Jerseyans showed up and picked up Narcan on that day. Stay, stay right there. Jackie, hire our producer. Do this. Can you tell everyone, are we putting up the website for, for the Department of Human Services? Can you say what it is and we'll put it up? Go ahead. Um, NJ.gov backslash human services. NJ.gov backslash human services. Can folks find out more about this day? Absolutely. And then in addition to that, we have just recently also made naloxone free and available to all the staff at homeless shelters across our state. So we're continuing to think about how do we push naloxone out to as many sites as possible so we can save someone and then get them connected Com to Commissioner, real quick, uh, I, by the way, next time you come back, we'll talk about Work First New Jersey. Okay. Um, but I want to do this. On the prevention side of the opioid crisis, what's happening? So we are investing in community-based organizations to do outreach and education to help people understand what alternative to opioids can look like. You know, there are therapies, there are physical therapy, there are other strategies um, before um, you initiate use of an opioid. Now, I understand that some people have been on opioids for a very long time, and so legacy users, that's a different issue than initiating a new opioid prescription at this time when we know how addictive these um, drugs can be. And so we should think mm -hmm. about, and we should ask our physicians and our nurse practitioners about other alternatives. Carol Johnson has been with us here on State of Affairs. She's the commissioner of one of the largest, largest. maybe the largest. largest, it is the largest department in uh, state government, part of the governor, Governor Murphy's cabinet. She's the commissioner of New Jersey Department of Human Services. They have a huge portfolio. I want to thank you for joining us and we appreciate thank your you time. Thank you for having me. This is a State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're at NJTV and we'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs is pleased to welcome Chris Sturm who is uh, Managing Director in policy of Policy and Water at New Jersey Future. Good to see you, Chris. Hi, Steve. Nice to be here. Tell folks what New Jersey Future is. Uh, New Jersey Future cares about the state of New Jersey and wants it to be the best place for everyone to live. And so we work on statewide issues, making sure that we're developing in the right places, in the right ways. We're investing in our infrastructure in smart ways and preserving a healthy environment. You know, uh, infrastructure, never a sexy word, you know, but an important part of the economy, important part of our quality of life. So today, while we're taping State of Affairs, we had the mayor of Newark, uh, Ros Baraka, Ros Baraka, talking about the water situation in Newark. It's a serious problem. But it isn't just Newark. It's communities all over the state, all over this nation. So let's deal with New Jersey. There are 300,000 water service lines in New Jersey. What does that mean and why does that matter? Right. So um, there are 300 pipes connecting homes to the water main under the street. 300,000. 300,000, thank okay. you. 300,000 pipes that connect homes to the water main under the street, and they're lined with lead. And lead leaches in from those pipes into the tap water as, it ent as the water enters the home. What we've learned from Newark is that we can't rely on corrosion control or filters. There are short, good short-term solutions, but in the long term, we need to remove the source of the lead. We need to remove those pipes. And that is a statewide challenge. How expensive are we talking? Our best estimate is about $2 billion. Mm -hmm. $2 billion. Right, right. 
But we mm -hmm. think it's an investment that pays for itself in lower costs for education, for public health, even for things like incarceration. Well, hold on. What is... What does that have to do with public education, public health, incarceration? Right. Well, lead is a really powerful neurotoxin that impairs the healthy brain development of young children. And so if children have lead poisoning, and they can get it from paint and soil as well as water, it impairs their ability to learn, lowers their IQs, and causes behavior problems. And those kinds of things cause problems down the line. So let's stay on this. I'm curious about the whole question of um, what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Now, it's one thing to say we need to change the pipes, but I am curious about something, and I, I don't know I'm not the only one who's thinking this. These are lead pipes. Right. What made folks think, the so-called experts, the engineers, the people who were making this happen, the policymakers, what made them think that these lead pipes wouldn't, quote, leach? I mean, I don't get that. It's really a curious thing because even Benjamin Franklin understood that lead was not good for people. People sur you know, surmise that the Roman Empire might have um, declined in part because of lead poisoning. But lead companies around the turn of the century and the early part of this, uh, the 2000s, or I'm sorry, the 1900s, used lead because it was less expensive and it was more malleable, easier to fit around corners. And I think there was a strong lobby among lead manufacturers. A lead lobby? back in the day to use lead in plumbing. Without thinking of the long-term ramifications. That's right, that's right. Now, you know, we have stronger federal regulations, but as we've learned from Flint and now Newark, they're not strong enough. It's interesting, you, you and I asked Mayor Baraka this, and please check out, if you haven't seen the show, check out our website at Steve Adubato and look up the Roz Baraka interview. When I mentioned Flint in the same ses sentence as Newark, the mayor made it very clear, no, no. They have a very different situation. The cause of their water problem in Flint was very different. And uh, we're way ahead of this now. They're moving forward. There's a $120 million bond issue that's gone out, borrowing the money to do this. And the mayor says he believes it will be done in the next two and a half to three years. By the way, do you think that's realistic? I think it's a great aggressive goal. And you know what? If they're a year late, so what? I, I think Newark is doing the right thing with that kind of timeline. Okay, but go back to what the mayor said. Flint and Newark, not in the same sentence, you say? I say Newark is in much better shape than Flint, but there are parallels. Go ahead. Um, I think in both places, the people who were living in those cities were surprised to find out how bad the problem was. And in both places, the solutions can't come fast enough. I mean, the latest thing that happened in Newark with the filters being found to possibly not work was really unfortunate. Um, the city... Unfortunate is a funny word because I don't know what it means. Yeah. It was worse than unfortunate. How did that not know that these filters, some of them, would potentially not work? How do you not know that? You know, they were... Newark was using the filters recommended by the EPA that had been used in Flint successfully. So it was a big surprise. Um, we are now waiting for much more thorough test results to come out, which could be any day now, and okay. we'll have a better sense of what you happens. You know, it's interesting. The issue of transparency comes up a lot. Yeah. Do you believe your organization, New Jersey Future, does your organization believe that the city administration in Newark was, quote, transparent enough about the water situation in the city of Newark and its impact on residents? I would say that local officials across New Jersey, elected officials, can all learn a lesson from Newark, which is that the quicker you can share bad news, the better off when it comes to building trust, even if you don't have all the answers for the solution. It's a very difficult thing to do because this is a public health issue and the public can become very mm -hmm. upset and that's hard to manage. But I think what we've seen is that transparency builds trust. You're part of a task force. It is the Lead and Drinking Water Task Force. What is it, what is it and why does it matter? Sure. Um, a collaborative organization called Jersey Waterworks convened 30 people, experts from different perspectives, utilities, including the city of Newark, regulators at the state and federal level, and community and environmental advocates to come together and devise a statewide solution because we know that um, lead service lines are found across New Jersey in hundreds of communities. And so on October 10th, the task force will be releasing a comprehensive package of solutions that we think builds on what Newark is, is doing and learning. Chris, let me ask you, would you be surprised to find out that other communities throughout the state, say in the next six months to a year and beyond, that they announced 
Bad news, as you describe it. By the way, we're talking with Chris Term from New Jersey Future. I'm Steve Adubato coming to you from the studios of NJTV for State of Affairs. Would you be surprised to find out that other communities in the next six months, year, beyond 18 months, hey, we have a problem, because you just said, release the bad news. Would you be shocked? No, mm -mm, not at all. Ticking time bomb? My words, question, is this a ticking time bomb? Yeah. I think it is. You know, we saw um, Suez Hackensack, which provides drinking water to 57 municipalities in Bergen County, affluent suburban county, and Hudson County, um, violating federal standards within the past year. That was a big surprise. People don't know exactly which towns that was happening in. And so there's a lot we can all do to provide better information. But that same scenario can happen and will happen in other places. It can happen anywhere. Right. The good news is once you know you have a problem, you get much more serious about fixing it. It's been really easy for folks to bury their heads in the sand because it's, it's a hard Can't thing. Can't do that anymore. No, nope, exactly. Uh, Chris Term is Managing Director of uh, Policy and Water for New Jersey Future. I want to thank you for joining us on State of Affairs. This has been uh, another edition of State of Affairs. So let's continue the conversation. Follow me on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Make sure we'll see you next week. Thank you, Chris. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Holy Name Medical Center, the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Sharing Network, New Jersey Resources, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, Adler Aphasia Center, and by Wells Fargo. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly and AM970, The Answer. Holy Day Medical Center is leading the statewide effort to improve end-of-life care through the use of advanced directives, recognizing a person's wishes on how they want to spend their last chapter of life isn't about death, it's about living. Our goal is to help all patients maximize their quality of life in their final months, weeks, days, and hours.